Good morning, folks. Good morning, good morning. Thank you. Thank, oh, thank you for turning up. Actually. I shouldn't say that. Uh, thank you for Kevin, actually, for turning up. That's um, pretty amazing. Um, horrible day, eh? Horrible day. I was just laughing. When, when Kevin turned up, he couldn't get in the front door, which is classic me, isn't it? I've got to unlock the front door. So he went around the back, and this figure appeared with an umbrella. And I said to Kev, this is, this is, when I, this is very similar to when I visited New Zealand. It was absolutely horrible. It just rained and rained and rained. Uh, and I was looking forward to going to all these geological localities, and it just pisses down endlessly. So this is quite nice. So I feel like I'm getting my own back. Just like back home, really. Just like back yeah. home, yeah, exactly. Well, I'm delighted, and it's an absolute privilege to welcome uh, Kevin to Sam's. Uh, it's, it's genuinely an honour, really. Thank you for, for coming over and talking to us. So Kevin's been at uh, NIWA, uh, National Institute for Water and Atmosphere, for 32 years. Uh, Kevin looks after the environmental data sets. Kev's a marine geologist. Uh, we've just been reminiscing about the Antarctic, which is really nice, so we've got common, common ground there. Uh, but importantly for Sam, Sam has just signed uh, a memorandum of understanding with the Nippon Foundation Seabed 2020 for data sharing for seabed mapping. Um, so I'm delighted Kevin's... Uh, been able to come over and talk to us, in particular about this incredible event, the, the Tonga eruption, uh, which would be really interesting to hear about this. Um, but of course, uh, you know, this is, a, this is a really good opportunity for Sam, it's a great opportunity uh, for us to, to talk to Kev, and uh, I'm delighted to uh, welcome Kevin, and the uh, floor is yours, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for attending on this. In this, well, it's a typical day if I was back home, but it's a pretty miserable day. I was just saying, actually, I've been in Scotland now for three days, three, uh, two weeks, and this is the first time it's rained in Scotland. So, <laughs> thank you, Oban. It's fantastic. So, um, I'm going to talk to you about this. This is all about this particular eruption of a volcano in Tonga last year, um, which I mean, I don't know how much media there was in this part of the world, but for our part of the world, in the Pacific, it was. It was a tragic event, it was a dramatic event, it, and, and from a scientific point of view, it, it's literally rewriting all the textbooks. Everywhere we, every way we look at this volcano and at this eruption, um, the textbooks need to be rewritten because there was nothing about this that we thought that it could actually happen. So let's talk about this eruption. I'm going to start off with some background geology. Um, just in context, oh, I'm going to point, this, this, this red laser is pretty horrible. So here's New Zealand, here's Tonga. Tonga's due north of New Zealand, it's in the South Pacific, it's pretty close to the equator. Um, and, in, and in context of the geology, we have a very active subduction system here. This is the Pacific Plate, and it's uh, subducting very fast under this Tongan microplate, which is part of the Australasian plate. Um, it's the second fastest subduction rate in the world. It's very, very active. In fact, this plate is subducting so fast, it's literally ripping this part of the continent away from this part of the continent, and you're getting active seafloor spreading in between. This is called a back arc basin, the Lau Basin. But the, the net result of the subduction, uh, we get subduction, you get melts, and it creates this line of volcanic um, edifices. This is called the Tofu Volcanic Arc. Actually, these volcanoes start in New Zealand. If you've been to New Zealand, we've got some very active volcanoes um, that start right in the middle of the North Island here. And this is just a northern extension of this line of volcanoes that runs along this, this plate margin. And it's a... It's a very, very typical volcanic margin. It's the same as you get in the Caribbean and Indonesia, the Philippines, Japan. Um, it's basically, these are strata volcanoes. These are basoandesitic lavas. They're not very uh, explosive. Completely, t everything about the system is completely typical in terms of submarine volcanoes. What's really cool is that it's actually a very active, this part is very active margin. In 2022, there were five of these volcanoes erupted in a calendar year. So it's a very active region. And most of these are submarine volcanoes, and the first we know about as humans is suddenly an island will just spontaneously appear. And the first thing we hear about it is a plane flying overhead or a yacht sailing past saying, hey, there's an island that's just magically appeared. Um, and these islands um, are, are just are summits of these underwater volcanoes that have reached the surface. And typically these islands last a few months to maybe a year or two, and then the erosion just wa washes them away. If I zoom in a bit to Tonga itself, this is the main island of Tonga, Tonga Tapu. The capital, Nukulofa, is just there. 
Um, it's, it's, a, it's the capital of Tonga, and with just within 100 kilometres of Tonga, we've got these red um, stars that indicate active volcanoes. So it's a very active region, and for the people of Tonga, there is always a strong volcanic risk um, being so close to these volcanoes. The volcano I'm going to talk about is Honga Tonga. I don't even see that. Can you see that laser or not? Yeah, yeah so, so it's this, this edifice up here is the one we're talking about. Now, um, it's called Honga Tonga Honga Hapai. I'm going to talk about the names in a minute. Actually, it's, it's um, such an unremarkable volcano that out of all the science expeditions that have come through here and mapped these volcanoes, there's only actually been one scientific expedition in all of human history that's actually bothered to even look at these volcanoes. That's how uninteresting they are. And, and, and when, it, when, when, the, when the Australians came through and they mapped all these volcanoes, they missed this one out because they didn't think it was important. They went up through here and carried on. They, there was nothing significant about that at all. And, and it wasn't... Um, it was, a, it, was a, it was a quirk of, of situation where an American vessel in 2016 was waiting to come into Tonga Taipei for some parts. It came in at night, had some time to kill because it couldn't approach the harbour until daylight. So it decided just to quickly map this volcano in 2016. And that was actually serendipitous because it actually gave us the only information we have of the volcano before it erupted. Now, it is a very large... No, in, in, in land context, it's a large volcano. It's 20 kilometres across and it's 1,600 metres high, so it's higher than Ben Nevis. Um, it's a big edifice, although it's completely typical in submarine context. So what we see here are two islands. We have Honga Tonga, which is this one out to the, to the north. Honga Hapai is out to, the, out to the east. These are just two islands that are the surface manifestations of this larger volcano. So in, 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 um, Hawaii, in Tongan uh, naming things, they only name islands, they don't name underwater features. So you have these two islands here, and then what happened in December 2014, a new island suddenly appeared between these two. And in the space of three years, this new island grew and eventually connected to the two other islands, and actually created a new cone 120 metres high. And because this now island is being joined, the new island is called Honga Tonga Honga Apai, because... Why not? Um, and, and, and a fun fact for the Tongans, the P is actually pronounced with a B. So it's hung a half by. So that's what the, the, the volcano looked at in 2018. It stayed pretty much like this until um, very early 2022. And this is a video I was going to play. This is real time. This is January the 14th, 2022. The volcano started erupting. Um, and there's a couple of things I want you to see here. First of all, I want to comment about th this is a drone footage from a vessel uh, with volcanologists on board. The vessel was three kilometres away because, again, this is a, such a typical stratovolcano. When it erupts, we put an exclusion zone, a no-go zone, and based on our science, our no-go zone was three kilometres because that's anything close to three kilometres is dangerous, so that's where that boat was. But I want you to observe this phenomenon here. You have a very large explosion. You have... Explosion push, pushes rocks, um, lava into the atmosphere. Eventually, the force of the eruption cannot sustain the weight of the rocks. Gravity takes over. It comes crashing back down, and you get these bluing avalanches coming up the side. And you watch for recruiting. There's one of these going to come crashing right over the top of this island here. These things are called pyroclastic density currents. Okay, So these are phenomena where they're basically avalanches of hot rock and lava that are gravity-driven, um, very, very common in, in, in the subaerial uh, world, very poorly understood in the submarine world. Um, and the only context that we have for this in the submarine world was some work done by Knock in Southampton on Montserrat Volcano, where they mapped a pyroclastic flow that started on land and then ran down underwater for 700 metres. That was the only scientific journal ever published about these phenomena once they enter the water. So they're very, very poorly seen um, and incredibly poorly described. So that's January the 14th, 2022. Um, overnight, there was a brief pause in eruption and, and the planet satellite managed to take this picture where that cone that we saw before that was 120 metres high is now gone. So the vent itself is now underwater. So it's gone from a sub-aerial volcano in the air to actually a submarine volcano, and it's created two new islands. So this is taken at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on January the 15th, and uh, two hours later, this happens. Holy, Holy shit! Holy shit! 
So that sound you heard um, actually turned out to be the largest sound ever ever heard, ever. It was heard audibly in Alaska, 11,000 kilometres away. I heard it in New Zealand, 3,500 kilometres. I was mowing the lawns and it sounded like gunfire, like a barrage of artillery. I thought, what, what the heck is that? We don't hear gunfire in New Zealand. It was the largest sound ever heard in human existence. Now, you look at the textbooks, you Google it, you probably get Krakatoa as your answer. Krakatoa was heard in Darwin, 4,000 kilometres away. This was heard in Alaska, on the other side of the Pacific Ocean, audibly. Someone heard it. It was an incredibly loud bang. And, and the effects on Tonga itself, and, and we have to be really, really mindful of the fact that we saw how close this volcano was to Tonga. Tonga is a very, very poor country, very poor country. It caused three deaths, 80% of the population were directly impacted either by the tsunami or, or the ash fall that landed um, on the volcano. All underwater communication cable, or cables were lost. So there was actually, when it happened, and I know there's, a, there's actually more Tongans living in New Zealand than are living in Tonga, people were panicking. There was mass panic uh, real time because no one could actually get through to Tonga and saying, what the heck happened? Are you, I mean, even talking to anyone in the government, no one. You couldn't, there was no communication with anyone that's saying, what the heck happened? Are you okay? What help do you need? For hours, if not um, nearly 12 hours, no one could actually communicate through to Tonga. It was a very, very scary time. All crops, lives, water, fisheries are badly affected, um, mainly by the ash fall. Um, the ash, as it landed through, it contaminated all the drinking water supplies. It contaminated, it landed on the leaves of all the crops. Um, there's very, ish, uh, very serious human health issues about um, the toxicity of the ash. Is, could the toxicity of the ash come through into the plants that they eat or the, fi uh, the food that they eat? Um, we didn't know at the time. Um, fisheries were affected because uh, when that tsunami came through into the ports, it actually damaged every single fishing boat in the entire country. There was actually no ability to even go out and even catch fish to have a feed the next day, let alone do an, do an industry. And, and it basically uh, nearly 20% of the GDP in cost um, and damage. And again, Tonga is an incredibly poor country, so that is actually really tragic. And I do, I just want to get a little shout out to Tonga. So. Um, in our part of the world, if you come to New Zealand, you come to a meeting, you have the little introduction and you say, you know, the fire escape's here. But if you come to New Zealand, you also get, in a case of an earthquake, do this. In a case of a tsunami, you go here. So it's part of our culture in the Pacific about what to do in a tsunami. And it's true in, uh, true in Tonga. There was a public education system where they were just told that don't wait for the sirens. If something really unusual happens, just go to high ground. And that's exactly what they did. There was the sirens never trick about, hopefully if you remind me, um, why, the, why the tsunami alert system was never triggered. The sirens never triggered. Everybody just heard that bang and they just went straight to the high ground. The whole population. The only reason three people died is because they ignored what the advice was and they went back to their properties to check their properties and the tsunami got them. But if it wasn't for this public education system, and, and you know, here's the benefit of science and, and, and making benefit to society, that death toll should have been much, much higher. Now, this is from space. I want you to ignore the cloud. Can you all see that blast wave rating out? Did you all see that? That's the sound, Bl that wave blasting out. That's an air pressure blast wave traveling at 1,000 kilometers an hour. That's that sound that radiated out. And actually, in, in today's modern um, society where just about everybody has a portable, well, a home weather station with their own little atmospheric sensors, we could, we could measure that blast wave globally, and, and the results are quite scary because we actually can detect through the pressure systems of the METSIS uh, services, that blast wave went around the world three times. It was, it was so powerful, it just kept going around the world. That blast wave was so powerful, the Met Office in the UK detected that the clouds moved. It literally shifted the clouds above the UK and the other world. Uh, it's just amazing. That blast wave was so powerful, the atmospheric blast wave, it actually generated a tsunami in the Caribbean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. So, you know, again, think about that. Tsunamis, how are tsunamis formed? Seafloor displacement. We've got a measured tsunami that 
favorable to the eye to instruments in the Atlantic Ocean and Caribbean simply because of that pressure blast wave. It was absolutely stunning. Now, going back to that video, remember that video when we said that those, the, you know, as scientists, we said the safe zone was three kilometers away and that little boat was three kilometers away? I, I actually had to do a calculation to say, well, you know, what, what would have happened if that um, boat had been, been there when the bang happened? And actually had to use a nuclear blast wave calculator to work out the air pressure. And the simple results is anyone there three kilometers away would have been vaporized. It was that powerful. And so I thought, okay, what's the minimum distance you had to be to survive as a human? And the answer was 20 kilometers. At 20 kilometers away from that blast wave, you would have had bones broken, but you would have survived. It was an incredibly powerful explosion. And a couple other cool facts. I remember I said, every time we look at this, it just breaks every single record. Just, we're rewriting textbooks all the time. The first obvious thing is that it's the highest plume ever recorded. In normal volcano research, and you look at the textbooks, what happens is you get these big clouds, like plinian clouds, that come up from, from volcanoes like Vesuvius or volcano, and they reach up 20 kilometers high, and then they hit the bottom of the stratosphere, and then the jet stream winds in the stratosphere smear it out, and that's what creates the umbrella cloud that we saw in the video, this umbrella cloud, because it's, it's hit the bottom of the stratosphere, and it's just billowing out, because it can't push through that jet stream. This cloud went to 57 kilometers. It was so powerful, it punched right through the jet stream, went into the mesosphere. Never, ever been seen before. That blast wave was so powerful, that explosion was so powerful, um, NASA detected material in outer space. It actually pushed material from planet Earth into outer space. It's, it's, I, mean, I think you know, one of the moons can do that, but that's it. I mean, it's just, it shouldn't happen in theory, but it did. It was an incredibly bla uh, powerful blast wave. Just in, in context, the, the eruption rate has uh, worked out to be about 5 billion kilometers per second, is what the eruption rate was. Incredibly, incredibly violent event. Another cool or fun fact, um, it's the most um, highest uh, abundance of lightning strikes ever recorded at one time. 2,600 lightning strikes per minute. Um, never been seen before. Again, every time we look at this and every time we look at the data, some new record has been written. It really was a tremendous event. And th this has just come through. There's some work that's just been published. Um, so what we're looking at the here, let me explain what we're looking at. We have we got years on the bottom. This is about moisture in the in the in the in the atmosphere. So it's in the stratosphere and the troposphere. Uh, where there is, um, so it's been normalized to an average, so where there's blue, it's a drought, it's a dry season. Where there's red, it's the wet season. So you can actually see the seasonality coming through in the South Pacific. Of course, in the South Pacific, our summer is over uh, Christmas time, which is also a rainy season. So that's where you get these rainy seasons around the breaks in the years, because that's, that's very typical. But you look what happened in 2022. Where's my laser? Oh, forget it. But you can see this big bloom here happening with an eruption. All that moisture has gone into the atmosphere. Um, something like uh, 500 billion, uh, 500 billion tons of water has been blasted into the into the stratosphere. Right? That's all high. Look how high that water is. It's not in the atmosphere. It's not coming down as rain. It's gone into the stratosphere, and it's now circulating the world in the stratospheric winds. And what's really scary about this is actually. It's really, it's, it's, we're now looking at it, it's actually mucking up the jet stream winds. So one of the reasons why um, this year, the summer this year has been crazy, you're getting those really, really hot spills, and then you're getting those really intense rainfalls, and again, I think there's another hot spill coming, it's because the jet stream is doing completely different patterns than what it's normally doing, and it's, it's really weird. And yes, climate change is a big driver for this, but this has super changed the effect, supercharged the effects of climate change. So your really, really hot summer and the droughts you had, and the wildfires in Canada and the floods in New York is actually partly because of this volcano pushing so much water into the stratosphere. Now, what's, what's scary from us in, in the austral part of the world is around Antarctica, there's a, a, there's a polar vortex that actually separates the climate systems from the rest of the world to Antarctica. Antarctica is quite isolated in its climate systems. And that water hasn't penetrated that barrier yet. But the million dollar question is, if that moisture gets above Antarctica, what's it going to do with the Antarctic climate system? And Antarctica is what drives the world's climate, through its because it's massive ice creating all the ocean currents. It drives all the ocean currents on the planet, all the ocean currents. And it drives all the weather. We really don't know what's going to happen. Hopefully the moisture will stay out from Antarctic systems, but we don't know. Now, I saw this video. Someone showed me this video and said, hey, Kev, check this out. And I thought, oh, I don't remember seeing two islands out there. 
they're not islands. They are 40 meter high waves of water rushing towards Tonga. That, 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 that is the tsunami coming towards Tonga. And that, this is really interesting because, you know, if you watched the YouTube video of the Boxing Day earthquake or the 2011 tsunami in, in Japan, and you see aerial footages of just tip from the rise and just wall to wall, a wall of water just, just coming through. That's not how the tsunami worked in Tonga. It worked as these very, very localised um, waves, very, very incredibly high peaks, incredibly high localised troughs. It wasn't this wall. There's something really complex going on. This isn't because of the blast wave. This is actually displacement because of that big bang. Um, but again, something really, really complex is going on in those tsunamis. And this is a, this is the tsunami modulation. Uh, so what we did here is we got the tide gauges around all these islands around Tonga. Um, and we knew the timings of the bangs from, and the eruptions from various sensors. So we back calculated a model that, that predicted um, what we saw on the tidal gate to actually work out what happens. And, and this is what the tsunami model looks like. So we have a first eruption. That's the big bang. And then 40 minutes later, a third tsunami. Now that's, that's actually interesting. So we know from those, when those boys are videoing it, there were, there were multiple bangs. We know that the eruption started at 5.17 p.m. local time. And that was, that was the first tsunami we saw, the first eruption. The big bang happened at 5.21, four minutes later. And that was the end of the eruption. It started at 5.17, it finished at 5.21, 1,000 seconds. That's all it took. So the first tsunami was the eruption starting. The second tsunami was the big bang. But what was that third eruption 40 minutes? What was that third tsunami 40 minutes later? Um, we actually didn't know. But yet that, that third tsunami was the largest tsunami. That tsunami was so high, we know um, we had, Niwa had weather sensors on Tonga uh, that were per, per, perched um, 25 metres high um, on top of a hill, and they got wiped out by that tsunami. So we know it's at least 25 metres high it went on land. So it was a big wall of water. That was from that third tsunami which again, that we didn't actually understand what it was from. So that's what happened on that day. Um, so you can imagine in New Zealand and, 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 and the Pacific, it was just chaos. Now, what the heck happened? We didn't know. And as scientists, um, you know, we had to respond quickly. We had to go into Tonga and actually try and understand what happened, why it happened, why did none of the textbooks say anything like this should happen? This is a strato volcano, completely normal. It shouldn't bang like this. It just should not happen like this. So I was tasked as voyage leader to do the scientific responses. When I was planning the voyage, this is the map showing all the data we had um, for my planning. So all we knew was um, these white line, this white line here, this white line, the east-west white line, is the international communications cable that joins Tonga to the rest of the world. The vertical white line is the communications cable that joins the islands of Tonga, and those yellow crosses indicate where the cable was, we found broken ends of the cable. So within those yellow crosses, I can draw a, a rough um, black dashed line saying, okay, whatever happened to this eruption affected the seafloor at least within this radius, because obviously the cables to break, something's happened on the seafloor. So that's our search area in there, 6,000 square kilometres we had to start looking forward to try and work out what had happened. Um, what was really interesting, what confused everybody is, you notice this little star here, that cable, that was found five kilometres north of where it was laid. Okay, so again, one of the things was, why did it move? We didn't understand it. Now, our working theory going into it, as, as volcanologists with all the years of human experience and science said, the only way to get a bang like that is if the entire magma chamber was exposed to water. That's the only way we can generate that. And the only mechanism we can come up with is that the sector collapse. Part of the mountain slid away, uh, which is what happened to Krakatoa, just like in Mount St. Helens, just mountain slid away and the magma chamber was exposed. So we fully expected this volcano to be totally shattered to bits, just a stump left. Um, and we think what happened here was it was so violent it created avalanches down either this volcano or this volcano, some sort of sympathetic avalanche response that could explain that, um, that displacement of the cables. That was our working theory. The edifice was broke, blown to bits, um, exposed to the magma chamber, and there was some sort of avalanche happening in, cause in, in the system here. Now, I should point out, this cable is in a valley system that's independent of this. There's actually a topographic rise here and here that separates that volcano from that. So it's a completely different drainage system. So we thought there's no way that volcano could affect that cable, given it's in a completely different valley system. Now, I shall go back. I forgot to mention these 
lines around here, the, the, the orange and the red lines, these are lines I experimented with. These, these are no-go zones. Um, it, it, we, we got, we, our response was to send a research vessel with a crew of about 40 of, uh, crew and scientists on board. Um, and, and we're very experienced in submarine volcanoes in our part of the world. And we do not want a, humans to be anywhere near the summit of the volcano. And, and the reason is really simple. It wasn't so much if it blows up again, because we knew it couldn't do that. But the issue is that um, all volcanic eruptions, all volcanic eruptions are powered by gas. It's as simple as that. And it doesn't have to have much gas, just a little bit of gas coming through. It will change the density of water. Um, and, the, and then suddenly you find out that steel boats don't float in gas. So if you happen to be blunting along um, unexpectedly, the gas comes up underneath you, can disappear. And we know this from, from experience. This has actually happened before. So in 1952, an underwater volcano um, just south of Japan erupted. Japan sent two, of the two vessels. That's one of the vessels here. That eruption, that, that is the eruption, but it's not the one that caused the damage. But a second boat was watching this boat sailing along, um, and, and it literally just disappeared in front of their eyes. It just vanished, like, faster than you can think about it. Just no chance being on board. It has happened in the past as a very real threat does not have to be a big eruption, and there's no way it's going to let me and my crew and my scientists get anywhere near the top summit of the volcano. So we're going to plan our mission. We're not going over the summit. So the mission we planned um, was going to use this vessel here. It's called the research vessel Tangara, which is New Zealand's blue water research vessel. It involved um, seabed mapping. But again, we really under understand, um, you know, did the mountain blow itself to bits. We had deep deep toed camera systems, which is high resolution videos and stills, because we really wanted to observe on the seafloor the effects on the seafloor. We had a lot of biologists on board, and the biologists are very interested in how the, how the benthic life was affected by the eruption. We had CTDs, standard CTD rig with rosette bottles. Um, we had a lot of biogeochemists on board, and they were really interested in the chemistry of the water. They wanted to know how all the ash percolating down through the water would change the chemistry of the water, and how it would do with the various systems in the water, so that's what that was for. This is a, that was a fish pump, that was a trace metal pump that we're looking at for trace metals. And we had push cores, because um, we wanted to sample the sea floor because we were interested in the, um, the life that lives on the sea floor and under, under the sediment to see how that was affected by um, the eruption. And we had gliders. So the gliders were great because we could deploy the gliders over the volcano itself. We could do just basic CTD and, and, and ocean chemistry over the summit while the boat was safely on the outside of the volcano. So that's the traditional part of the science that we did around the, the sides of the volcano, around the area. But to really work inside the crater itself, and again, I didn't want to risk human life, we used an uncrewed surface vessel. So an uncrewed vessel, they've been around now for about five, six years. Um, it's, it's a boat, but there's literally no humans on board. It's not a robot, it's not an autonomous vessel, it's not pre-programmed, it's actively steered real time by humans. It has a multi-beam system on the gondola here, and you notice there's a steel cage at the back. Uh, it has the ability to deploy a whole lot of probes on a 300-meter cable. Now, this particular wasn't my money. I was quite happy to risk somebody else's money into the volcano, so yeah, go for it. So it was fantastic. So that was what we used to actually fill in the summit, map the summit, and actually get more chemistry inside the summit of the volcano. And, and um, what's cool from a British point of view, um, you're waving the British flag here. Um, it's a British kit. The actual control, the, the, the bridge of the boat, the word is actually in Essex. That's the bridge. They sat there and they've got the cameras and the radars and echo sounders and they actively steered the ship. Um, and, and the scientists that uh, we used, um, we used scientists from um, Nipbon Foundation Jebco run a training course. It's, it's, a, it's a very intensive postgraduate training course at the University of New Hampshire, which is an incredibly good, very, very elite course to go to. But they have a, a pool of alumni that have graduated from that. So we use those alumni globally. Stars indicate where the alumni were. And they literally, from their homes, opened their laptops, and they ran all the science systems on board real time. You know, they, they'd actually, if they see something, they can, they can go WhatsApp or whatever to the skipper in the UK, say, hey, stop the boat, turn around here, we're going to deploy some equipment. All the stuff. And actually, I had a... I had actually um, a little star for me. I actually had a, had a shift on it. It was actually pretty amazing. I was doing a shift um, in my lounge in, in the middle of the night on a comfy, comfy chance, and I'm doing science, man, in my house on a comfy chair. I mean, it was, it was very, very cool. And, and this is actually a screenshot from my phone. You get a little app, and I can actually control it from my phone. 
I guess you could say real time, oh, I want the boat to go over here, go over there, push a button, I can deploy some, some equipment. Um, you know, I could be shopping in a supermarket and actually running science systems. It was very, very cool. From a, from a technical point of view, um, I would like to point out that all this was happening in Tonga that um, still has no communication systems. Um, and I really have to say this to the Americans and the Europeans, there is no satellite constellations really for, for comms out there. Very, very poor bandwidth for any satellite communication. So we really struggled to get satellite comms with the world, very small bandwidths. It was a big struggle. Tonga, God bless Tonga, last year um, was in lockdown, COVID lockdown in January. It never had a single COVID case in its history because all the all borders were closed. This eruption happens. Um, the aid arrived and it tried to do contactless aid delivery and it didn't work and COVID got into the system. So they had COVID sweep through their, through their country, killing people um, while we were trapped there. And so what it meant was we could not put people in the ground on Tonga to do any of this deployment. So all done completely remotely with no one on the ground to really help out. So it was actually a very tricky science operation to do um, without actually having a market or actually <laughs> ground helping out. And this is the result. This is the result we got. This is, this is the seafloor map of the area that we did combined through the Tungara and the, and the, and the USD. You can see we really traded um, mapping the volcano itself you can see we really worked on the communication cables because we really need to understand um, what happened to the communication cables. Um, could they, you know, the, the cable company wanted to know, could they retrieve them and fix them? Um, just around these transects out the side. And again, this is a bit of a scientific hubris. We were actually hoping to make a, an ISO pack map of the ash fall. We wanted to try and calculate how much centimeters of ash had fallen and work out distally. Um, you know, how thick the sediment thickness was as we moved out. So we created these transects running out to actually look at ash fall. Um, and and it, that didn't quite work out, and I'll explain why in a minute. So if we zoom into the volcano itself, remember I said there was a, we had 2016, the American ship just happened to, to map over the top of it. That allowed us to generate a before picture, a before eruption picture of the volcano. That's the volcano afterwards, and there's a profile, two profiles between that. The, the solid line is the before eruption. Um, uh, profile, the dashed line is the post-eruption profile. The first observation we had when we were mapping is, holy heck, the volcano is still intact. Remember I said that our working theory was the volcano basically blew itself to bits. Uh, we couldn't think of any other mechanism that exposed the magma chamber. The volcano was completely intact. In fact, actually it was not only intact, it was actually pretty well, looked exactly the same as what it was in the before picture. The difference is that hole. I, I can't guess how big that hole is. That hole is uh, 870 metres deep when it was at sea level, and it's, and it's only four kilometres across. The actual rim has not changed. It actually hasn't affected the top or the outside of the volcano in any way, shape, or form. It's just created this massive hole, 870 metres deep. It's incredibly, in fact, it's so deep, there's another 100 metres of soft sediment on top of that. So actually the hole itself is getting closer to nearly a kilometre deep, and it's only four kilometres across. It's a truly massive hole. And you, when you look at it you know, in profile, it's almost the full, full height of the volcano. It really is a tremendously large hole. So let's look at the volcano itself. Again, this is the after shot. Uh, we're, we're out there mapping and going, where's, where, you know, why is it not shattered the bits? It's fully intact. What the heck's going on? We did notice some differences immediately. We noticed there were some subtle um, valleys with crescental dunes and scows radiating down the sides, which indicated maybe some of those pyroclastic density currents, like we saw in the video, actually flowed down. We actually saw some evidence of some sort of density current flowing down. So that we had some indications that this might have happened. And we also noticed right out to the, to the north um, west there, some large sediment waves. Now these waves are huge. The wavelengths are two kilometers and wave heights are 200 meters. These are very large waves. Now these waves were there in the before mapping picture, but they have completely changed from uh, after the eruption. So quite clearly, something has flowed out that way from the eruption. Now the cool thing is, what happens if you get the before picture and subtract it from the after picture, you get a difference map. And the difference map actually shows you the true effect on the seafloor from this eruption. So this is the difference map, loss gain. Everything in dark blue is where seafloor has disappeared from the before eruption picture. And everything in red is where seafloor is being added. So if I run this video and rotate, this actually gives us great indications that actually 
there are many, many, many of these pyroclastic density currents that flow down. And what's interesting is on the steep slopes, these slopes are close to 45 degrees, where there are steep slopes, these avalanches were very erosional in nature. You see they're eroding the way down the seafloor, but as the slope gentles out, it changes the flux of these flows, and it switches from an erosional to a depositional. And you can see all this new material is being deposited around here. Now, what's really interesting out here, <coughs> excuse me, is it's gone back into an erosional phase. And the reason is simple, is that the, the eruptions come down here, and there's two seamounts on either side, and it's refocused the energy, re-accelerated that flow, and it's gone back into an erosional phase, and it keeps scouring it's gone away out. That's nearly 100 kilometers away still scouring. So at some stage, there's going to be a depositional fan, you know, beyond 100 kilometers away. And also, don't forget that in terms of the scientific knowledge that humans knew about these things was Montserrat, where they found them to 700 meters. Right now, we've got direct evidence of 100 kilometers. Um, it, it's just it's just scale and magnitude bigger than anything we've ever seen before. And what happened to the communication cables? Well, quite simply, this is a video animation we put for the cable company. Um, effectively, what happens is you have this debris coming down through the water column, smashes into the volcano, comes rolling down, and certainly the domestic communication cable just got wiped out by an avalanche. It's as simple as that. That domestic, that north-south one, was really close to the volcano, and it just got wiped out. And, and um, it's, it's, you know, the cable company have got no chance of retrieving it. And in fact, it's actually been buried by nearly 30 metres of material. Uh, it's completely uh, gone. Now, I apologize for this. This is what happens when you let scientists run animations. Um, this is actually a pyroclastic, um, this is one of the density current models. Um, just the gray is the island, the red dot is, is the seed that we use for the model. Uh, and I'm going to let this, let this animation run just to see you based on the size of the hole and the volume of material we see being removed, we can estimate how much material is evolved in a pyroclastic uh, current. Set that off as your starting parameter in your model and just let it run using the bathymetry and, and this is what you get. So this model indicates that these flows can, well, these models indicate we, we, we should get in flows nearly 200 kilometers away. Um, and and that's, um, that's, that's an incredible thing. Again, it's, you know, science said 700 meters, we're now getting 200 kilometers based on the modeling. So this is this model, again, this is one from a science journal. We have this difference map. These dashed lines are the modeled flows, where the modeled flows say there should be. In actual fact, we see a good correlation between where the model says the flows should go versus what you see in reality in the difference map, sort of a validation for that model. Um, but this that little um, figure down at the bottom uh, right there, that's the sort of working model we have for what's causing these flows, where you have this material from the summit, and that, that volume there is six cubic kilometers, so at least six, six cubic kilometers has gone into the atmosphere, up to 57 kilometers high. The eruption stopped, gravity takes over, 57 kilometers high, that rock just comes crashing back down to Earth, onto the steep slopes of the volcanoes, it's accelerating. Now what's really cool, we've, this paper's just been published, we knew when that bang happened. We knew 521 was when the bang happened. We saw that, 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 that third tsunami that we can't explain. That third tsunami is actually this material coming back down to Earth. That's the third tsunami. And from that timing to when the cable was cut, we can get speeds of the flows. And we've just published a paper, speeds of up to 122 kilometers an hour underwater. Now, again, the fastest ever underwater um, current that's ever been detected was 70 kilometers an hour off the Grand Banks of the uh, United States. We're getting nearly double that because of this. Uh, incredibly fast. And it, again, it's just, we think it's because it's, it's hot, um, it's just so much volume, and it's come from such a height that it's just gained so much energy and it's just smashed its way down. So it's just created this amazing event. Just in terms of the volumes, of, in terms of my calculations here, in the blue, just in that blue area there, I can calculate nine and a half cubic kilometers of material has disappeared. Nine and a half cubic, that's, I can't even begin to put that in context that people can understand. That's a lot of rock that's just disappeared in a thousand seconds. Of which in the red, I can identify 6.7 cubic kilometers. So they're still missing nearly three cubic kilometers of material that we know is gone, 
and it's got to be out there somewhere. And we think that's gone out for, based on the modelling many hundreds of kilometres away further off. We, we didn't look far enough away. Remember at the time, we were looking for ash. There ain't no ash. It's all this debris uh, from these uh, uh, debris flows coming through. Um, in terms of, um, I know we've got some um, topaz people here. We ran topaz. This is the topaz lines. You can see we kept away from the summit. Um, the topaz is actually quite disappointing. The topaz is a sub-bottom profiler. You use acoustics to look through the seafloor to try and identify um, layers beneath the seafloor. What we discovered that actually that these density currents actually uh, form impenetrable layers. They're very, very hard to penetrate. So all the way across these flows, we're just not getting any penetration. But where the flows do thin out, as, 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 as we know now that these avalanches have gone down the valley, up the other side and really thin out, we can actually see some really good cases where um, we can see the flow structure as it cuts through the existing geology. So this actually does prove that we've actually got some really good evidence here especially up this slope here, where um, we actually do have some good penetration and, and see these layers from these um, avalanches. Again, another really complex diagram. Those black lines are where the modelled said the pyrocystic flow should go. Um, the X's and the O's are where we actually took uh, video cameras down um, and, and cores. To try, again, we're looking at Asheville, but actually it allows us to ground truth the pyroclastic model to say, is that true? Um, but what I want to draw attention to is this core out here, which is 80 kilometers away. This is this core that we got. And actually, we have this beautiful density um, current um, cutting through. That's the old seafloor. And then you have a classic uh, density current turbidite, if you were, uh, flowing through 30 centimeters thick. Um, we sampled that. We've done the geochemistry. This has definitely come from this eruption in January. So we now have definitive proof that the avalanche theory that we've got is true. We've got definitive proof um, through, through the coring and through the geochemistry that this eruption at 80 kilometers away, these flows are still 30 kilometers thick. Uh, let's talk about the international cable. Remember the international cable had broken and it was found five kilometers north. We didn't have a difference map. We, we didn't have any mapping before. We couldn't do a difference map to find any uh, um, if there's any changes in bathymetry. Um, but the indications were there was nothing obvious. There's no avalanche scarps. We could not explain why that broken cable was found five kilometers north. But then we got this piece of um, evidence here. This is called a backscatter. Do you guys cover backscatter? Yes, yeah, so this is the backscatter image, which is basically the, the, the amount of energy um, from the echo coming back from the uh, multi-beam. So anything dark is high backscatter. Anything dark in this map is, is hard rock. It's, it's reflecting a lot of acoustic energy back to the receiver. Anything light is, is soft material, so it's not much energy coming back. But what you can see is you can actually see this, this really light material coming through here. And then up to here, and then if you look here, you can see there's a really, really nice in the backscatter, some really nice mega ripples coming through. And we know they were not there before the eruption. So those mega ripples are new. So that tells us quite conclusively, well, that we think that the avalanche is so powerful, it's gone down the hill, it's gone over two valleys into this valley. So it's actually gone, I had to climb 100 feet, 150 meters high to just to get in this valley alone. And then it sloshed backwards and forwards like water in a bathtub broken this cable and dropped it off here. So, and it, what's interesting too, we took the timings, we knew when that, we, we knew when the, when the tsunami started, when, when that material entered the water, we knew when this cable was cut. Even here, the flow is doing 56 kilometers an hour just to get here. After going over two valley systems to get here, it's still flying incredibly fast. Okay, let's talk about the biology. You guys must have a lot of biology here. Biologists must be interested. So let's look at the biology. So, um, so the biology was covered by doing camera systems. We did co towed camera systems. They were um, two miles long, um, no, three mile long camera tows. Um, and we just ran them over um, areas. And, and as, as we were recording, um, we had biologists aboard and they'll push a button. Even though they saw some sort of um, um, species group, they'll push a button, um, just some quick determination saying, I saw something. Only live things, we didn't record dead things. Um, and this, this is the result of what they saw at sea. So a healthy ecosystem in this chart with very large pie, pie because the size is dependent on abundance. And it should have many, many segments, which, which depends on different um, species classes or species groups. 
right? So that's what a normal healthy ecosystem is. A very poor ecosystem is going to be a very small pie because it's not much abundance and mainly have one or two segments. That's, that's not natural and that's not healthy. And, and what's really scary is an X. An X is we towed for three miles and saw nothing. And when I say nothing, I mean not even marks on the, on the seafloor, just no evidence of any life whatsoever. So we're going to show you some videos now of what this looks like. This is the volcano. I'm going to show you some images um, on some of these Xs, which are part of the really, really strong pyroclastic density currents that we saw. Um, and this is what the video looks like. So again, we're focusing really on, remember that difference map, those dark blue tongues that are coming down. This is the area where a vast amount of seafloor is being ripped up. Uh, and, this is, uh, and this is what it looks like. So this is in that dark blue tongue. What we're seeing here is um, huge ripped up clasts, you know, quite some quite serious energy, just just chunks just removed away. And everything's blanketed by this this uh, mono mono grain sized um, uh, sediment. So our interpretation of this is energy is ripped out. This is all old old material that's being exposed as the avalanche has come through. And this fine material is the fines from the avalanche debris that settles on last. Because you get into the turbulent, into the under a density current, the fines go into suspension, and as the flow stops, the fines settle down, and it just blankets everything. And you observe, like, this, there's not even, this is four months after the eruption, there's not even marks, you know, no critters have come along here. It's just nothing living at all. Now, at least focus this in contrast to um, some places where we see high biodiversity. Again, we're focusing on a couple of things, only a few tens of kilometres from the largest ever explosion that's ever recorded in human history. Um, and, and yet, you can see from the pie charts, life is, is really abundant. So this is what a normal ecosystem should look like. Whip corals, hydroid sponges, um, we see anemones. Those rip corals are really, really fragile. If there's any sort of water movement at all, they should have snapped off. And yet, we see no evidence of any sort of trauma to this. No ash. There's no material deposit on this at all. You know, we know in Tonga, ash fell and it poisoned the plants and the water supplies. There is absolutely no evidence that even a volcano erupted on these volcanoes. And some of them are less than 10 kilometres away from the summit of the one that went bang. Completely unaffected. And, and, and what that tells us is, in, in, the, in the proximal part of the volcano, all that material went up, out and over and all the energy went underwater. So if you're any topographic high, you were completely unaffected by it. And, and this actually has huge implications for the biology and the recovery. In, in the paper we just published, we know we call these refugia, but these are these are um, st 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 stores of genetic material that are really, really close that can be used to re-colonize re, re, um, those areas that have been completely wiped out. And you know, fish stocks are great, but again, um, the good news about the fish stocks, bad news if you're a fisherman, there are no fishing boats. So, in terms of the fisheries, um, the stocks are great. In fact, they're commercial species that used to fish there all the time. They've completely moved to a completely new part of the country. They're, they're, they're not interested in coming back. The fishermen, when they've got the new boats going out, found that they're big deep sea snappers, totally gone, can't find them. They've all moved somewhere else. And they might not come back to this part of the world where they used to be. Now, um, a lot of the biologists are interested in all the critters that lived inside the sediment, which is one of the major points of the push calls. They actually look at um, the life uh, on the seafloor and under the seafloor. Um, and, and, it's, and it's not good news. So again, this is, this is one, of the, one of the distal slides. We can see the old seafloor here, just this new avalanche sediment on top. You know, anything that was living down here, forget about it. It's, it's gone. Uh, it's not going to survive that. Uh, and it's not good news uh, in other parts. This is really muddy, quite watery. Uh, coming up this side, which is getting close to Tonga, what you're seeing here is this really, really coarse, dense, this is air for ash that we're seeing here, thick. Um, and, and the fun thing about that is it's actually almost like a non-Newtonian fluid. You press hard and it goes completely solid. And, you know, if you're, if you're a critter that's trying to borrow its way to make, uh, make a new burrow, you know, it could be very, very hard to actually borrow its way through and re-establish a community there. So what the implications are for that, um, ash area, we, we, you know, we have to watch this space and see what was survives. And this again, it's just a, just a, 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 um, a reinforcement of, of the, our model. This is the pyroclastic flow model that you saw before in that horrible green image. These black marks are where we saw no life at all, and those red marks are where we saw life. 
And that's just, just another bit of evidence to receive that reinforces our, our, our theory about these avalanche debris just wiping out the seafloor everywhere. Where the model says it touched the seafloor, we're not seeing anything. Um, where there are topographic highs, we actually observe life. So we actually think that our, this validates our pyroclastic density flow model. And it also tells us going forward, this is where we should be looking. You know, am I missing two and a half kilometers of material? It's all gone out that way into the Lau Basin. We didn't look in the right place. Um, and the third part of the survey we looked at was in the biogeochemistry. Any volcanic eruption uh, puts chemicals into the ocean. Any, any volcanic eruption in, in, in the marine environment puts chemicals. And you see here from this image, this is a much earlier uh, photo um, from 2018. Um, but you can just see all the, chemi the chemicals in the water. I mean, it, it just has to affect the chemistry of the water. So we had biogeochemists still really interested in, in, in um, the water, the ocean surfaces caused by uh, the ocean currents uh, and the chemistry. Um, the first thing we observed after this uh, was, um, this is an image of chlorophyll A, um, two weeks before, two weeks after, an incredible plankton bloom. It's the first thing we observed. So we know straight away that the first response on the ocean to all this ash falling through, because ash contains a lot of nutrients, is the plankton bloom. The downside of the plankton bloom is it didn't last very long, but it quickly consumed all the oxygen, dissolved oxygen in the water. And actually, when we measured it now, we're still seeing a dissolved oxygen deficit in the layer where that plankton was. So the long-term effects of that plankton bloom, we really don't quite understand yet. Um, just going to run this video through of a, of a normal CTD thing, because we, we observed through the glider, and through the CDD, some really strange phenomenon in, in, the, in the layering. There's some um, responses we couldn't understand, and we thought the responses was because it's actually the air for ash still falling through the sea floor. But our calculations said that, that ash from the eruption should be sitting at about 1,200 metres, should be deep. So this, we just happened to put a, a GoPro on the, on the, the CTD, um, and, and it happened to capture this. So we're going through the tropical waters. It's going into the, into the dark zone now. Beautiful, like the, 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 the um, visibility is amazing in the tropics. But then at 200 metres, we enter this effectively a cloud. And it's like going through a fog. It was like really, really weird. And this matched up perfectly what we saw in all the instrumentation. Something was at this 200 metre layer um, that you visually see and we see chemistry. Because once you got through 250, you're back into clear water. So there's something happening at 200 metres that is, we know it's not the ash from the eruption because the calculation says it should be much, much deeper. There's something else happening on that, and we, and we couldn't really explain it. So we snap one of those rosette bottles at, in the layer, and when we look at that, um, that, that material through a microscope, what we're seeing is glass shards. Um, and these are very, very sharp glass shards. It's, it's clearly volcanic glass. Um, we know it's not air for ash, because air for ash has a very specific grain size and shape and roundness, and has air bubbles in it. These are glass shards. These are classic shards that you get from pillow basalts where that we have a magma or lava into an ocean and, and it instantly turns to glass and shatters. That's the sort of glass we're seeing. So that kind of says, you know, is the volcano still erupting? Because that's, that's, what, that's what this evidence appears to be. So we really needed to know um, what's going on. And again, if you looked at the, the CTD material, you can actually see if this is the top volcano here and we're moving away from the volcano, this layer stands it really, really strongly in the beam transmission. It's, it's quite clearly a, a very strong layer marker and it's staying at the same depth um, as you move away from the volcano. And if you looked at it from a map, uh, in terms of density, it's very, very strong close to the volcano. You see evidence of it further up. Now, there's no sampling bias here. I haven't just have not put on all the dots where we took all the stations. We took stations everywhere. I'm just showing you the places where we found the glass. So that tells us that wherever this is, is volcanic glass, this is our theory, it's coming from in there. We think the volcano is still erupting, but we needed that extra evidence. Um, and again, uh, one of the, actually one of the other experiments ran, is if the volcano is still erupting and it's still putting m m metals into the water column, um, what are the implications for that? Now, volcanoes traditionally are nutrients. You look at all the, um, you know, the rich fields around volcanoes to grow because it's actually a very good nutrient for growing things, but too many nutrients is toxic. And our experiments show actually there's, there's so much metal being pumped into the ocean right now, it's actually having a tremendous toxic effect to the volcano. So what the long-term um, uh, implications are to the ocean health, we really don't know. But we know it's definitely toxic. And if the volcano is still erupting, we're still having a long-term effect, a long-term 
um, toxicity happening still now. So what the implications are, we really don't know. Now, we're going back to the C-Kit again. What the C-Kit could do, this is the USV machine that had an echo sounder, real time, we could see in here, we can see here, this is the sea floor, we can see pluming. You can actually quite clearly see um, something was discharging inside the volcano. And, and we see lots of discharging, especially around the, around the edges of the volcanoes. Something we know from the acoustics, something was definitely discharging. Now, is it just hydrothermal systems, which means that glass we're seeing is just recirculating of the old glass from the January 15th eruption? Or is it volcanic activity, in which case it's new glass being generated? That was the next question you needed to know. And that uncrewed surface vessel, remember, had the little cage in the back? One of the probes we could put on was this probe here called a mapper unit, which comes from NOAA. It's a specific you know, unit that looks at oxygen reduction potential. It's designed by volcanologists to actually go into um, hydrothermal plumes underwater and actually make the differences between, looking, by looking at the chemistry, is it coming from fresh magma, fresh lava, or is it just hot water coming through? And, and you see the plumes, you can see that the places where we deployed it. Again, this is really cool because, you know, you're on the screen or on my phone or whatever, in acoustics, and you see a plume happening real time, you can say, stop the boat, deploy the mapper. You know, you could target something in real time. Um, nothing's autonomous. It was all done uh, real time with people talking. So it was actually a very, very, fit. you can see the mapper unit tucked into the little cage in there. Uh, it's actually a very, very cool bit of kit, and it's quite exciting to do. And, and the net result uh, from those mapper units is that what we discovered was the acoustic plumes rising from the seafloor, uh, remember it's 870 metres deep, we can trace the plumes up to 650 metres and then they stop. I mean, what it means is actually whatever is in there is dissolving into the water. It's not reaching the surface. So based on that, I'm quite happy to put a human vessel on top of it because those bubbles aren't reaching the surface. It's just got going high enough. But what we tell from the, from the plumes is actually there is lots of reduced chemical species that are, um, that are uh, common to volcanic activity. So actually... This is actually some evidence to suggest there is actually fresh lava being injected into the sea floor still. And what's cool is this thing here. This is actually a little cone, and I think it's actually a post-eruption cone. I actually think that's actually new, a new volcano growing up from the bottom of the sea floor. So it's still erupting. Um, and I'd just like to, about to finish, one more slide to go. But um, science communication, I gave this presentation um, to the Tonga because uh, they really want to know it on the volcanoes. And I said, hey, you know, good news, the volcano's still erupting. Um, and and, and, and like, I got no reaction, like dead silence in, in the audience. And I was like, what if I offended somebody? And, and they all shuffled out. And afterwards, I said, what's the story? And they said, in Tonga, they're incredibly religious. Like, I think they're mainly Methodists. Like, you know, Sabbath is holy, and everything shuts down. They're always at church. W when the volcano went bang, they freaked out, the, the Tongans, and they all went to church because they thought it was God's wrath. You know, the, 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 you know, COVID and this, and, and they all went to church, and they prayed hard, um, and then they were just beginning to be relieved. And I come up saying, hey, the volcano's still erupting. And they went, oh, we haven't prayed hard enough. And they, and they all went, went back and had to pray some more. They really got really, really anxious about my blindly blurting something that was scientifically interesting, but actually the audience I was giving it to um, didn't go down very well at all. So it was a lesson for me as a science communicator, you know, think about your audience before you're saying amazing things. I could be excited as a scientist, but it might not go down too well to the, to the audience. Um, and this is the last slide. So, so what's next? Um, this was always supposed to be part of a multi-year project. We think now, we, we, we think we understand the mechanism of, of the bang um, and, and what we see on the seafloor. We now have to go back from the biology point of view um, and actually now that we see the sites that are completely destroyed, like when I say destroyed, like nothing, we saw no evidence of any life whatsoever, let's see what the recovery looks like. Um, I still want to find out my missing 2.8 cubic kilometers. I still want to find that out. We need to know whether there's still more volcanic activity happening in the volcano. We know that the ash we saw last year was toxic. Let's keep monitoring the biogeochemistry in the ocean and see what that toxicity looks like. And, and we... What we didn't have time in that voyage was to do a proper geophysical survey to actually look 3D through the sub-bottom to really understand the volcanic structure. It'd be quite nice to do that. So we will be going back. Um, we're just going to, so we're just seeking more funding. Um, we've got lots of interest. Actually, one of the biggest interested parties we have is the seabed mining industry. Um, they're quite keen to throw a lot of money at us because you know, the seafloor disturbance is the ultimate seafloor disturbance seabed mining experiment. 
You know, if, if vast, many thousands of cubic kilometres of seafloor is being disturbed, how quickly it recovers has huge implications about the, the, the environmental assessments they do for seabed mining and the effects they do for the air plume. So they're really keen to throw money at us, but politically, we're not, we just can't touch that money. It's just we can't be seen to be in bed with the seabed mining. Uh, and the Pacific Ocean, that's just a, that's just, that's a huge, huge um, taboo. And um, that's my last slide, except for to say, we have a little YouTube video. And, and I'm quite proud of it because it's my best, I mean, I'm in it, so you've got to watch it because I'm in it. Um, it's currently sitting at 785,000 views. I want to get to a million. So get on YouTube, search for Tonga Volcano Niwa. Let's try and get it up to a million. <laughs> That'd be quite nice. And that's my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks.